Good evening. <laughs> so this gathering is for three evenings. Five to six thirty. Okay? And it's my turn this month. <laughs> so So I prepared something. I prepared one page which I've distributed to you. And also I have uh, distributed a small booklet, Compassion in Individual by His Holiness Dalai Lama. I'm not, of course, not teaching this, but I'm giving you this from my side, not from the library, as a gift to you, appreciating your interest. Okay? Because The, the reason we organize such talks in the evenings is obviously not to make money, although we are charging 100 rupees for registration, which all of you may have done or may not have done anyway. You can, if you want to do, do it later. But that's not important. Sometimes it is important to know how many people are coming, you know. Anyway, that's one thing. Then second, we do this with sincere wish in accordance with His Holiness's vision, suggestion and need of the time, the need to preserve Buddhism, the need to preserve Tibetan culture, so many things, keeping so many things in view. We strongly feel it is important to organize these kind of talks and at least, not necessarily just hearing from the teacher, but at least we all come together with a positive mind, then reflecting on the importance of these things. Recently I was reading a book, I don't know how many of you have seen that book, it was a very new book called Unplugging. Have you read that book? Unplugging, which is we are all plugged, huh? <laughs> we are all plugged and running and running and running. So in order to really flourish and improve your life, it is important to unplug occasionally and be with yourself, enjoy calmness, do certain reflection about the importance of human life and what is, which ones are more important than others to do in human life, how much time you have in this life to do good things. So there's so many important things to to reflect upon. So this kind of gatherings might also help in uh, strengthening that kind of attitude, right? So that's why I have distributed this small book, so that you please read it and understand His Holiness thinking and see the relevance of it later on. So as I said, the purpose of such gathering is that we really do something. I thought of, I, I, so many thinking come in my mind. I thought about like, for example, organizing one week long, like compassion week. You see, then doing this kind of study, reflection, meditation, and then testing actually, when the, how you can lead a compassionate life the whole week, experiment with that. In our dealings with other people, you know, in our, you know, uh, workplace, in your association with other people. I think occasionally it's really, really important. So therefore, I'm, I'm sure many of you are, if not veterans, but at least many years of Buddhist practitioners. Whatever be the case, since this topic that we are going to discuss is a Buddhist topic, which has universal application, so it is important to give a little bit about idea about the, the Buddhist teaching in general, not going into detail. So the subject that we are going to talk and discuss is related to the Buddhist practice. We can make it otherwise also, but we are explaining it within the context of the Buddhist teaching. So there are few important questions we must ask. What are the core teachings of the Buddha? 
why it is important to practice such, such teachings in today's world because we all think now we are you know updated advanced smart modern person you know why why we need to go back 2500 years back and read those many people have this kind of thinking you see so therefore it's important to see the relevance of the dharma in today's world this each of us have to individually see that i cannot see that for you you cannot see that for me in order to really make impact in one's own mind and life it is important to sincerely honestly question number one find a little bit, little bit about the if not the whole at least the, some core ideas of the buddha's teaching and then see it is relevance in your life in the world today i have been telling people buddhism must make sense in today's world you can go to the comfort zone <laughs> and talk about nirvana enlightenment so many bombastic big things okay that's fine but to an ordinary lay people sometimes difficult with finding time it's also important to get the crux of the matter the core ideas and see how important how relevant these are develop conviction so that's why in in the buddhist practice we have this three fold process of practice listening to the teaching number one second reflection just listening is not enough you will immediately forget so having listened to the teaching you need to reflect see for yourself how much this makes sense and through that way when you find that it really makes sense then you need to make your mind habituated with that that idea that good practice that's called meditation making it part of your life three fold practices hearing thinking meditation now the subject that we are going to study contemplate and listen is buddha's teaching so here it also becomes important who is buddha you know if you want to do really good research who is buddha now epithet for the word buddha is budh the exact sanskrit or hindi word is budh that means somebody who is fully awake fully enlightened what does that mean to be fully enlightened to be fully awake it has a lot of implications it also has the implication if buddha is fully awake what are we doing are we sleeping yes indeed we are sleeping so huge implication with all this knowledge is so when we say buddha is somebody who is fully awake fully awake to what to reality the law of nature i'm trying to simplify to the law of nature now that again tells us that just as buddha got fully enlightened or fully developed or evolved or awake to the reality we also need to do that why if we are to awake fully to the reality what are we talking about when we talk about reality what are those realities why is it important to be fully cognizant of that reality this is a very very crucial issue, issues and we can already <coughs> do a lot of thinking contemplation just on this few points that i already raised fully awake to the reality why we need to fully awake or realize the reality because much of the suffering that we encounter in varied forms physical suffering mental turbulence even among mental problem there are so many 100000 different destructive emo- emotions right all this are said to arise primarily from confusion confusion in the sense of not knowing the reality we call it ignorance ignorance which is actually basically saying that the sufferings that we are encountering today is in a way 
unnecessary suffering. Unnecessary suffering. Unnecessary suffering in the sense there is a possibility to remove these problems, these difficulties, or at least lessen and reduce these sufferings, these problems. But because we are not making effort to understand those various aspects of reality, so therefore we are, there's no other way but to continue to suffer by seeing what is not true as true, what is impure as pure, what is suffering as happiness, the four misconceptions as we call it in Buddhism. Right? So this is the big statement, all our problems arising from ignorance. Ignorance means, as I said, not knowing the reality. What is reality? The reality of interdependence. In a more technical way, we call it emptiness. But basically we are talking about the reality of interdependence or emptiness. Then great teachers like Kung Thang Tempe Dome, he says, yes, it is true, all our sufferings arise from ignorance, so therefore it is important to understand shunyata or emptiness, but it's not easy. So before you try to understand that shunyata or emptiness, there are many other slightly, you know, less difficult to understand realities, like impermanence, like suffering. So you need, we need to start from that. In short, what, we are, what I'm saying here is, all the countless sufferings, problems, difficulties, upheavals that we experience in our existence in the world, are creations of the enemy called self-grasping. So when we talk about Buddhist practice, all we try to do is how to uproot this self-grasping, the ignorance, which is the root cause for all our problems. However, the Master says, however, this is quite subtle, very profound. So before you try to realize that subtle, profound, ultimate truth, ultimate reality, you should try to understand grosser levels of truth, like impermanence. Even within impermanence, grosser level of impermanence and suffering. So there are many stages, many levels. And then he says, even that very grosser level, understanding that grosser level of truth, reality, is also difficult for us. Not necessarily it's very difficult, but <laughs> our, our senses are duped. Our interest lies something else. So we don't even take steps towards dealing with these problems. He gives, the very, he gives a very concrete example by saying, whether you are young or old, we have seen so many people dying. We can count on our fingers. My relatives died, brother died, sister died, this person died, that person died. Or if you read the newspaper, every day. Every day, hundreds of people are dying due to different kinds of diseases all over the world. Now, it's not so difficult to get those figures. You can just click and say, find the death rate. We can find it. Right? Even after all this exposure to innumerable deaths, not only of distant people, but people who are close to you, it hardly occurs to us that my turn will come soon. Therefore, how could you think about developing higher spiritual levels? As simple as these things, we 
remain oblivious, don't pay attention. So therefore, what the master is saying is, it's important to pay close attention. You call it mindfulness, you call it concentration, you call it meditation, whatever you want to call it. There should be some kind of alertness, awareness, and cognizant of these happenings. Like, for example, if you do this meditation of death, the imminent death, that is definite, time is indefinite, can come any time. If you are somebody who is doing this practice, your life will be completely transformed. Completely transformed. So it's important to think about something that you experience all the time. Or you are bound to experience soon. If you think about those which is really going to happen to you soon, so that will make such an important impact in your life. Your, there will be quantum leap in your spiritual practice. Without talking about these things that really relates to your life, then just talking about Buddhahood, talking about God, or even fighting and killing in the name of God. These are all, if you allow me to use a bad word, bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> Really? Right? So talking about those things like imminence of death. You are, if you talk about these things, if you meditate and reflect, then you are talking about the real issue. Otherwise you are just having feel-good practice. I call it feel-good practice. You know, I went to the class, I listened to the teaching and it is so good. Good in what sense? It is hardly impacting your life, hardly making your mind change, hardly helping in improving your loving kindness, compassion, which we are going to talk about. So I have seen, including myself, you know, what we are doing, you know, is a different way of life. If you don't focus in that way, then what you are doing, some, some, uh, some people do business, some people do become tailors, some, pe some people <laughs> become monks, some people remain as a lay person, some people get married, some don't get married. It's the only different way of life. <coughs> because the focus is lost. The purpose for which you become a Buddhist, a spiritual practitioner, a monk or nun, the f focus is lost. Armies also wear uniform, so wearing uniform itself is nothing. Right? Now, for example, I'll just give you a hint, then you do the homework, okay? For example, if you think about death, imminence of death, which nobody can deny that death is definite, nobody can deny. If you can deny and prove that one of you is not going to die, I will sponsor several lunches and dinners, <laughs> that's all I can do, yeah? Right? Something like that. This is undeniable fact. Second, okay, death is definite, but time is indefinite, so... But time is indefinite means it can be tomorrow. I'm not unnecessarily trying to frighten you, because Buddhism is not pessimistic. Many people think Buddhism is pessimistic. No, it is realistic, talking about the real issue. Then you can change. Talking about the real issue. This is a real issue because if you really think about it, for example, if you, let us say, if you are going to die, say, after two days, let us say, then what will be your priority? In the next two days, what will you do? There is a story at the time of the Buddha. A mother with her son came to the Buddha. And then the Buddha said, pointing to the young man, he said, you have only one year to live. After that, you are going to die. So this young man like was, felt very sad. And then went back. Then after six or nine months, he came back to the Buddha to see him. Then the Buddha said, what did you do in these months? since I told you that you have only one year to live. Did you do something bad? 
something destructive, something harmful. The young man said, since I'm going to die within one year and already so many months have finished, you know, doing this, how can I think about doing anything bad? Instead, instead, I try to patch up with all other friends with whom I did something wrong or use harsh word. I regretted, repented, and I made more friendship with all these people and try my best to, do, to be nice, to live in harmony, to develop love and to develop compassion, you see. And then the Buddha said, I told you you are going to die within one year. I just told you to let you know the situation. I don't know when you are going to die. <laughs> I don't know when you are going to die. But I have been practicing this meditation for that, that really transformed my life. So that's why I, I told you to this so that you can really practice. You can see the difference. That will really transform your life. And I give another example by saying, for example, in front of us, if there's an elderly lady, 90 years old, terribly sick, wounds all over her body, fragile, weak, old lady here. Will you think, will any one of you think about marrying that lady? Huh? Marrying that lady? Approach that old lady dying, can we marry? No, right? Or any one of us will think about like harming that lady, bullying that lady. No! Why not? Why not? Because you have clearly seen the reality of that lady. So therefore at such a situation you really felt at least what I can do is not to harm, not to develop obsession or attachment. You found that that is the way to help when you are in trouble, when this old lady is in trouble. So that's what the Buddha is saying, that even if you are unable to see, obviously the suffering, as you have seen with this elderly lady, but through your contemplation, meditation, that all these people are going to die one day. All these people, whether I know or not know, but I know they have, each one of has some or the other individual problems, difficulties. Aging takes place with everybody, no exception. Finally, death takes place with everybody, no exception. In between, there will be sicknesses, food poisoning, whatever. <coughs> Definitely. There's so many things we can conclude that all is not necessarily well. So if you have that kind of understanding, <coughs> your heart will naturally melt. You may, not, you may not become Buddha overnight, but at least your, your overall attitude with other people will be different. Will be different. That is called practice. That is called Dharma. Dharma means a way of life, a practice which will not let you fall down. Dharma from the Sanskrit word Dhaura, which means to catch hold of somebody, helping them not to fall down. So therefore we undertake or we do such practices, not because it is told by Buddha, enlightened being, you know, that may be one reason, but that's not the main reason. Not because he is holding the Dalai Lama said this. Not the main reason. The main reason is, I want happiness, do not want suffering. Nobody can deny this. And I'm quite convinced with this one because I ask this question to so many people to so many countries. Do you want happiness? Everybody says, yes, sir. <laughs> How many days do you want happiness? Everybody smiles. Because they are saying, Gisela is not for few days. <laughs> when it comes to happiness and peace, I want that as long as, as much as durable as possible, right? Right? So you have to start from there. I want that durable, long-lasting peace and happiness, for sure. This, this is not something you learn from Buddhism, something not you, you, you've not learned from your parents. You're born like that. You're born like that. In fact, I tell people that you, you came into this world with this slogan, I want happiness. You know the child, the first thing that the child does is crying. By crying, it, I call it slogan. 
the child is saying, I have a problem, I want happiness, a long lasting happiness. Child is saying, came with that slogan, you see. Right? So therefore, this you please remember, I want long lasting happiness and peace. So you should use your own human intelligence. Not necessarily in accordance with this teaching, but common sense. Common sense. Use your common sense, intelligence. Since I want long lasting peace and happiness, from where will that long lasting peace and happiness will come? You can write an article on that. Really? From material accumulations? Material accumulations needed. But I'm talking about long lasting happiness and peace, not fleeting pleasures. Can that long lasting peace and happiness come from your relatives and friends? I don't think so. Even from Buddha, no. It can come only through personal self-reflection and by cultivating the desired positive qualities, emotions within yourself. Are you with me on this point? If you don't, if you don't agree, there will be time for question answers. <laughs> I, feel, I, I strongly feel that this kind of questions should be asked. Because the practice we are doing is for our own goodness. It's not a show business. Show business. So through this kind of change of attitude, understanding, reflection, even if we get one day peaceful day, one day happy day, that's what we want. Not waiting until you become Buddha enlightened. No, no, no. Right now if you're happy, that, that, that's, that's what you want. That's why in the mindfulness practice we talk so much about being in the present, you see. Being in the present. Tomorrow is uncashed check. Huh? So your happiness, your suffering is in your hand at the end of the day. So you change your attitude, way of thinking and be happy. It can, it can be done. It's not impossible. It can be done. So to be happy, you don't have to have some lots of money or things like that, right? So anyway, we don't have much time, so I, I get digressed. So, so during this three days meeting, what we are going to, to do is discuss about the four immeasurable or boundless states. That is what we are going to. So in this short compilation that I've done. We are proceeding by doing prayer, then a little bit explanation and study, then finally a little bit meditation at the conclusion, and then asking you to do the rest of the work, post meditative session practice. That means 24 hours. So this is to, get, to give you an idea of how the Buddhist practice is done. Okay. Now doing prayer basically is not just chanting. The Tibetan word for prayer is molam, which means expressing a desire, a wish, that I want to have this. The more you express your wish, your desire, the more there is a likelihood of achieving it, implementing it. So we start with prayer. Prayer is there. There are two levels of prayer, so we read all this prayer together. Okay. May all sentient beings have happiness and its causes. May all sentient beings be free from suffering and its causes. May all sentient beings not be separated from happiness that is without suffering. May all sentient beings abide in equanimity, free of bias, attachment and hatred. And also the following words. How wonderful it would be if all sentient beings were to abide in equanimity free of bias, attachment and anger. May they abide in this way. I shall cause them to abide in this way. Buddha, please inspire me to be able to do so. How wonderful it would be if all sentient beings had happiness and its causes. May they have this. I shall cause them to have this. Buddha, please inspire me to be able to do so. How wonderful it would be if all sentient beings were free from suffering and its causes. May they be free. I shall cause them to be free. Buddha, please inspire me to be able to do so. How wonderful it would be if all sentient beings were never parted from higher rebirth 
and liberation's excellent happiness. May they never be parted. I shall cause them never be parted. Buddha, please inspire me to be able to do so. So these are basically saying the same thing, but two versions, two different versions. So these prayers we should do as much as possible, not only this teaching, but for long time to come. Such a wonderful prayer. Okay. So now with regard to the actual meaning of the four immeasurables of love, compassion, the four immeasurables are love, immeasurable love, immeasurable compassion, immeasurable joy, immeasurable equanimity, are widely taught and practiced in both the Pali and Sanskrit tradition. Okay. The four immeasurable apamana, apramana are spoken of in many Pali sutras like Visuddhi Mark, Metta Sutta, etc. In the Sanskrit tradition, they are extensively explained in the Bodhisattva Pitaka Sutra and so forth, if you want to read more, and uh, are essential in the Bodhisattva vehicle. So this is a little bit how these four immeasurables are widely practiced in both in the Pali and the Sanskrit tradition. Okay. So now in order to explain these four immeasurables, I'll give you a little bit about the Buddhist talk, a little bit about the Buddhist morality, Buddhist ethics. Okay. Now, after getting enlightened, when the Buddha was requested to give the teaching, he did not give teaching for several weeks. And when he finally gave the teaching, he, he taught the at Eightfold Noble Path, okay, which can be actually condensed into the three trainings: the training of morality, training of concentration, training of wisdom. So now here we need to ask this question: Why moral life is seen as integral, even indispensable part of the path to ultimate liberation? Why morality is important? And what is morality? Or ethics in Buddhism, right? Ethics in Buddhism has the connotation of three main points. Number one, refraining from negative ways of life, that's ethics refraining from negative ways of life. What are, what are, what are negative ways of life? Huh? Negative ways of life means anything that directly, indirectly makes other people, other life miserable, harmful, painful. I mean, we can talk a lot about this, but basically that's the thing, right? Second, so refraining from wrong ways of life, negative ways of life is important, wonderful. But is that enough? No, you need to do also the good things, the virtuous practices like development of love, compassion, all this you need to do. Second, that is the second ethics. The third ethics is not doing bad things is good, doing good things is good, of course. But for what? Just for yourself? No. Primarily for other suffering sentient beings. Because they are the majority. Right? So therefore the third ethics in Buddhism is helping other sentient beings. Beautifully explained, you see. Not doing bad thing, doing good thing, helping other sentient beings. So that's why the whole teaching of the Buddha is condensed into the four line. Do not do anything that is bad, do everything that is good, completely train your mind, this is my teaching. Finish, so easy. <laughs> you see, amazing, we need, really need to think by ourselves, do not do anything that is negative. Why? Because it's not good, it's like saying don't, don't eat poison. If you ask why, because it will kill you. It will make you sick. Exactly like that. So do not do anything that negative means. All those things which is not good for your health. Physical health, mental health. 
Uh, we need to pay serious attention to these things because otherwise most of us, even the grown up people are really like, including myself, we are like, in a way we are like innocent children, you know. Buddha is like a father, he says, don't eat this too much sweet, don't do this, but we say, yeah, yeah, but I like the taste, I like the color, and we go after this, you see. That's why physically we get sick all the time, mentally we get sick all the time, because of our own doing. So do not do anything that is negative. Negative in the sense, something that is harmful to you and harmful others. Like for example, anger. Like for example, anger. Now with this kind of practice, even if we make a promise to lessen the intensity of anger, your life will shine out. You will become less expensive. <laughs> really, honestly speaking. I read one book published in America where, it, where the writer says, in terms of expenses, economy, billions, billions of US dollars are lost because of anger. Because from anger comes suicide. From anger comes shooting, fighting, conflict, destruction. Anger and hatred leads to, it's like in a conflagration of fire. It only leads to death and destruction. It destabilizes you. As simple as that. So think carefully. Take some time. Pros and cons about anger. Be honest with anger. Don't just outright really say you are bad, but do a research on it. So it is very much possible that you will find it destructive. You get headache when you get anger. You get back pain when you get anger. You are unable to sleep properly in your bed when you are angry and upset and have hatred. It's all common sense things that we experience all the time. But the problem, as I said, is the problem is that we feel more comfortable to continue to stay in that same area where you are familiar, even if it is suffering. And you don't want to go out from, from that area to an area which is unknown to you. You get scared. So familiar suffering is better for you than the un unfamiliar terrain of happiness. That's the problem. So that's, that's why really much of what we experience is our own doing and our own lack of initiative. So talking we can do all the time, but the thing is practicing it. So I, with folded hands, plead you and plead myself also. <laughs> Practice a little bit. Just out of the 100,000 negative emotions, at least deal with one which has predominant presence in, in you. If anger is playing a more destructive role, make it a point to fight against negative anger. Reduce it. You will see the miracle then. You will see the miracle. Unless we do it, it's like, you know, reading a long menu in a fancy hotel, but if you don't eat it, <laughs> there's no point reading the menu. You see? Right? So find out which one of these negative emotions have a more predominant presence in you, because you are the best to know about that. And then try to see it is destructiveness as you have experienced. Not just we are talking, but as you have experienced. Because you have to see whether it's really useful or not. Sometimes we, we, we go under the, you know, confusion that many of these negative emotions, we think it's useful. In, fa in fact, sometimes we think that it's only these negative emotions which gives color to our life. If these, are, these negative emotions are there, then the life is colorless. That's what we think, honestly speaking. That's how we live our life. That is how it is portrayed in the movies. 
sex and violence are the two predominant theme of any movie that you see. Meaning this is a portrayal of our own life's experience. And we think that if these things are not there, life is colorless. Right? But actually it is the other way around. The less you have these destructive negative emotions, the more peaceful, stable, calm, focused. And the, the root of success of all the good things, even small projects that you do, is dependent upon how focused you are, how calm you are. So that is why morality is said to be the ground, in fact a fertile ground, to grow all other crops of religious practices. If the ground is fertile, even you, you throw anything, any seed, it will grow. You can grow concentration, you can grow wisdom, you can grow bodhicitta. This is so because morality means, ethic, ethic, ethics or morality means, as I said, Number one, getting rid of the negative emotions. Number two, developing all the positive qualities. Number three, helping all sentient beings. If you have all these qualities, you know, you can easily develop many other qualities. Easily. Right? So therefore, that's why morality, out of the three trainings, morality is the key thing. The most important thing. So we need morality because, as I said, we want that long-lasting happiness and we do not want suffering, right? The experience of suffering and the inflection of suffering upon others, whether it's your personal experience or whether you inflict that suffering upon others, have one and the same existential root, thirst, craving, desire. And its manifestation is attachment. So how this craving attachment comes? Because the attachment and craving comes because you are lured, you are ensnared or you lured by the deceptive promises of sensual pleasure. All for worldly enjoyment and the attachment to it. Lure. Just like a fish that is caught by the bait. The fish is lured. Right? So we, are, we get completely obsessed with this seemingly attractive, but hollow actually, seemingly attractive things of the life. And we go after this like small kids seeing a lollipop, you see. That's why I always say that we are really like, Buddha calls us, my, my children, we are really children. We get easily, easily distracted, easily entrapped by the advertisement. That's why these advertisements are flourishing. That's why these malls are flourishing. That's why what is flooding in the market is flourishing, you see. Because we are attracted by the nice, Packages, advertisements, we go after this. You see? You buy a fruit juice which is nicely you know, packed with some colors in but inside, heaven knows how old it is. <laughs> really, honestly speaking. We are quite innocent. We are quite innocent. Easily, our senses are easily drooped. The deceptive promises of sensual pleasures. Therefore, Shantideva formulated this following aphorism or this verse where he says, when somebody knives you, somebody knives you, he says, he's the knife, the murderer or who used the knife, he's the knife. From him, the knife came. So he's, he's somebody to blame also, right? And mind the body. 
But I also offer the body. If you don't have this contaminated physical body, nobody can kill you. Even if you have a body, if you have no craving, no attachment, nobody can inflict harm upon you. So he's the knife and mine the body, the twofold cause of suffering. The attack being carried out because of the attacker's attachment to his vicious goal to kill that person. The suffering of the victim due to his attachment to his own life. So at the end of the day, what Shanti they were saying, it's all because of attachment. For example, today everybody is running like being crazy. With all this modern development in terms of speedy transport and so things, but still people are rushing, rushing. I have no idea <laughs> why we are running so much, really. And I, I have give, given a nickname to the modern people. I call modern people Angulimala. <laughs> you know Angulimala? You know Angulimala? In India, there lived uh, a murderer a decoit who made a wrong teacher because of his suggestion he promised to take the life of 1000 people or 100 1000 right 1000 1000 people and this teacher said every time you kill one person you cut the finger and wear it as a rosary around your neck so he had been killing like this and 999 already he killed he was looking for the last one on that morning, Buddha realized that this is the time to tame that person. So on that morning, when he was looking for somebody to kill, he could not find anybody except Buddha walking at a distance in front of him. So the Buddha was walking slowly, and this Angulimala murderer with his very awful, ugly, strong, smelly body, and with the knife, <laughs> I'm exaggerating a little bit, okay, <laughs> to make you laugh. <laughs> and then he was chasing. Somehow he was running and chasing, but could not catch Buddha. Then he, then he shouted by saying, don't you realize who is chasing you? The dreadful Angulimala. Stop. Then Buddha stopped, looked back, and he said, it is not me who is not stopping, it is you who is not stopping. Because he has been running and running and killing and killing other people. So the modern man is a little bit like that, running and running and running, don't know. There is a Buddhist teaching, Tibetan teaching, where it says your, your feet are very swift, but you are not reaching the goal where you should reach. So now we not only have feet, but also aeroplanes. Right? But still running much more than before. I don't know. So therefore, it is not so much, what the Buddhist Buddha's teaching is saying is not so much by running, but being with yourself, understanding yourself, understanding the reality that you can achieve. It's not just by running. And in fact, I will talk about this later on. It's by running and running and so much running that now we don't care about the well-being of other people. Because we are all saying that, yes, I need to help other people, but I'm busy. I have to reach there in time. I'm only 10 minutes, you know, so I have to run. So can you imagine you are running and then you are not able to enjoy the scene. Nobody has time to enjoy the scene now. Everybody is running. Still thinking one day I will enjoy that. We are really like that. So therefore it is important to be with oneself. Before you are with others, it is important to be with yourself first of all. Because to be with yourself is very healing. Today it's widely known that people suffer from attention deficiency. Attention deficiency disorder. People not being able to concentrate and pay attention. And from there comes many kinds of diseases. So it's important first to be with yourself. Clean your house inside. Right? 
for the body we do a lot of things, but for the mind we hardly do anything. And I have been telling people that much of the problem that we are experiencing today in the world is because of mental starvation. Because we have hardly given any food to the mind. For the body, yes, we are giving. Even for the body, what we give is primarily junk food, but still, still we are giving something. We also do some exercise, a little bit of stretching, yeah? yoga, meditation, whatever, you know, so many things. But for the, for the mind, what kind of practice did you give? And mind is actually much more important because it's, the, it's your real boss. Your real boss is not your husband, not your wife. It's your mind. It's the mind which is dictating all the time. Go there, don't go there, do this, don't do this. Say this to other people, don't say this. Silently, you know, very kind of, in a very diplomatic way, <laughs> the mind is ruling you. And your, your poor body, you know, it's very submissive and doing everything the mind is saying, you know. Oh, eat this junk food. The mind will say, eat this junk food. Your hand will go and eat the junk food. <laughs> the body is really, honestly speaking, very, very helpless. That's why the Buddha paid so much attention to the mind, because the mind is source of good things. Mind is source of bad things. And mind is really the magician, the boss, the real boss. So one, one, whoever has this control and understanding of the mind, peace is guaranteed. Calmness is guaranteed. Because once you change the attitude, even if the whole cosmology becomes your enemy, so what? It will not be able to disturb you. I mean, it's easier said than done, but this is true, really. Like, look at the, the story of the Buddha when he was meditating for six years. At the end of the, the, the day when he was about enlightened, then all these evil forces, they get jealous, and then they try to do a few things. One, they brought this host of, you know, armies inflicting, you know, fiery weapons and things like that. Buddha did not get perturbed from his meditation, he continued his meditation. That is to say that violence and hatred cannot destroy peace, if you have that. That's not the solution. Then when that failed, then they manifested many beautiful dancing damsels, you know. Yeah? Singing, you know, flirting around him. But Buddha remained unmovable. They failed, you see. So this too, ignorance, as I already mentioned, is the root, plus hatred and attachment. These two are the, the sworn enemy. In Buddhism, we call these three, pois uh, three poisons. Ignorance, hatred, attachment. Three poisons. Okay. It follows that any successful attempt, I mean, if you make that attempt, if you make any successful attempt to reduce one's thirst or craving, attachment, or otherwise at least moderate one's attachment, will also result in a life causing less suffering to oneself and to others. At least, at least, less deliber deliberately inflicted suffering. That's what I'm saying. There are many levels of suffering. Much of the big jungle part of the suffering is intentionally created. So at least we can reduce the man-made sufferings. Much of the sufferings that we are encountering today is man-made sufferings. I mean, some of the concrete examples that's happening right now is what's happening in Syria. Innocent men, women, especially small children, you know, dying every day. You know, there's a lot of discussion going on whether it's they're used chemical or not. For me, this is less significant, whether they've used chemical or not, but people are killed. That's the point, you see. Why? And Shanti Deva says, you don't have to kill people, they will die. Look at the wisdom. You don't have to kill people, they will die. <laughs> yeah. 
In the same way, he is saying you don't have to create suffering. They already have suffering, you see. It's really like, like hitting hard on a bubble, you know, water bubble to stop it. Stupid. Total ignorance. So, to reduce suffering, that is what morality basically means for Buddhism. Reducing suffering, alleviating suffering, or causing less suffering, not harming others. That is ethics. Living a morally good life has two benefits. One, you will be helping other people. Okay? And one one's one self spiritual development and many other positive activities are positively affected. So it is a win win situation. A win win situation, you see. So that's why Buddha repeatedly said, you should use your intelligence, brain, and see what is beneficial, what is not beneficial. If it is the case, fighting is good. At the end of the day, fight. Violence is good. Use violence. But that is not the case. That is really not the case. So therefore, it is really, really important to see the great many benefits of this positive ways of life, developing loving kindness, compassion, fortitude, and so forth. And then in terms of actual practice of mor morality, we need to understand this in connection with the two other practices out of the three trainings. That is wisdom and concentration. Morality is purified by wisdom, wisdom is purified by morality. Both are uh, kind of interdependent upon each other. Of course, we can have a lot of discussions here and ask questions, why somebody sh in the name of moral practice, why should somebody develop loving kindness and compassion, why? Is it selfish to develop these positive qualities if you think that I will be happier and things like that? Is it the right practice or not? Or is it always possible to be morally correct? When we do go to do these practices, we very often encounter a lot of problems, difficulties, situations where you are compelled to tell lie. Things like that. So there are many areas to, to think about. But to make a long story short, the golden, golden rule is what is displeasing and disagreeable to me is also displeasing and disagreeable to others. You should see others in your own image. Whether you use the word compassion, loving kindness, or empathy, whatever word you use. In our individual case, we want everything that is good, right? We need fame, we need name, we need money, we need health, we need peace. Similarly, others also need, including your enemy. Including your enemy, right? So therefore, in this practice of developing the four immeasurable qualities, the most important quality is to develop this equanimity. Seeing everybody as equal to yourself. It is true somebody might have harmed you and today you will see that person as an enemy. But that is not the whole story. This same person might have helped you many times in the past also. Or past lives also. So there are many reasons, many reasons how it is better to develop love, compassion and so forth than hatred, anger, jealousy and so forth. 
Another very important caution with this practice of love and so forth is the compatibility of loving kindness, loving involvement and non-attachment. Right? On the, on the one hand you have this practice of loving kindness which is which many people think it's attachment. But according to the Buddhist teaching it says no no no. Loving kindness is not attachment, it is detachment. So the question is how you can how can you have loving kindness, that loving involvement without attachment? And why it is important? Why it is important? If you look at the definition of loving kindness, as I have written down there, if you read the actual meaning, uh, love, read that line, the love. Love has the aspect of friendliness. Its proximate cause is seeing others as lovable. When it succeeds, it eliminates malice or malice, I don't know this. Huh? Malice. Malice, okay. <laughs> My English class starts. When it fails, it degenerates into selfish, affectionate desire. So love, loving kindness here means wishing that others, as we have recited in the prayer, how nice if others meet with happiness and the causes of happiness. Now in order to develop that wish, you need to see others as close to your heart, as lovable. Right? So can you see this? See other sentient beings as lovable to you, everybody? This is a meditation where we are going to do. But I'll discuss this right now. Like for example, the process of meditation on, on loving kindness is, you start with Generally speaking, you start with somebody who you respect. Say your, your teacher or your guru. Because you respect, therefore, if you develop their loving kindness, it will be much more successful to develop that. If you, right in the beginning, if you try to develop loving kindness to ordinary people, especially to those who you like, especially to those where you have a sexual attraction, you will be confused. There is a big risk of confusing between love and attachment. Right? So therefore develop their loving kindness to somebody who is higher and who you respect and then gradually to people who you like. Then to the neutral people. Then finally to the enemy. Right? Now if you had a problem developing loving kindness to your enemy, what should you do? There are many ways of doing that. One, right now this person is my enemy. Because of his enmity, he gave me the opportunity to, to practice patience. So I'm thankful to that person. One way of thinking. Another way of thinking is, this life, he, she is acting as my enemy but not necessarily so in the past, especially past many lives. It is sure that in the past many lives, the same person has acted as my mother, father, brother, sister, and so forth. And also there is no certainty between who is your enemy, who is your friend. The so-called friend today might become your enemy tomorrow. The so-called enemy today might become your friend. And sometimes also when you have difficulty developing that loving kindness towards your enemy, it is encouraged to sometimes to try to talk to that person, to give a gift. In the Tibetan tradition there is a very interesting story of uh, somebody who had a lot of like problem with his brothers, always like, and the, the, I was reading this morning, it's so interesting. It says that we have been, we have been verbally fighting until my lips worn out. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
So there was so much fighting. So then, then he thought how to solve this. Because they have been fighting, he cannot directly talk to them. So what he did was, he hugged one of their ch child. So moving. Hugged and then kissed and then loved that small child. That completely mellowed that father of that child, relatives of that child. So there are many ways of doing that, you see. When I visited uh, uh, Colombia, where there's a lot of drug and killing, I was giving some talk. Some years back, I was giving some Buddhist teachings. It's, it's such a conflict, you know, written area, that even when the organizers took me to the airport, they would say, I wish that no trouble come, you know. It's really horrible. People might come, stop your car, knife you, take things out, you know. So that was the situation. So they, they said, Kishila, we have so much problem here. How should we deal with that? I was completely dumbfounded what to do with it. Then I started a little bit thinking, you know, thinking is important. Then I said, this, you know, drug mafias or, you know, problem makers, from where they came from? Did they drop suddenly from the space? No. They're earthly beings. <laughs> right? So I'm sure they have families. I'm also pretty sure that not necessarily all the family members, the wives and kids are all devils. And I'm pretty sure that there is some kind of love among their family members also. Right? So you think in this way, then you can gradually see different connections, you see. Then many of these people are probably displaced people having no proper business and things like that. So if there is an opportunity to give some business or land, things like that, then because of attachment, whatever, for the business or land, they will stop doing many of these destructive things. So there are some of these ideas quickly came in my mind, you know. So what I'm trying to say is that if we think properly, solution could be found. Now look at North Korea leader. I don't know how sincere he is, but he's saying that now he's going to meet Donald Trump and discuss. <laughs> You know, it, there was just a few months back, there was a point when he was hell-bent to destroy America and all the Japan and Korea. And he started launching missile after missile. He was not listening to anybody. Then suddenly there is a change, you know, whatever be the reason, you see. Still, we can't predict, but changes are possible, you see. So therefore, it is really, really important to be optimistic and uh, uh, to find that solution. So the loving kindness is sometimes explained as mind releasing. Mind releasing. Chitto vimuti. Mind releasing. Which clearly means that when you develop this loving kindness, you will be released from attachment. You will be released from attachment. You will be released from self-cherishing attitude. Egoism. Right? As one of the English saying goes, love is a quality that the blind can see and the deaf can hear. Is such an amazing quality. When you really have this loving kindness to others, people look different. The same person look different. Even you have, because, you know, beauty lies in the eye of the beholder, as we say. It's absolutely true. When you have this genuine motivation that others have happiness and peace, others without suffering, the same person, because of your changed perspective, looks different, looks nicer. When you don't have that <laughs> love and compassion, the same person looks ugly, horrible, aggressive, you know. You don't want to listen to that person. As and when that person is approaching you, you get back pain. I, I used to have that. <laughs> Believe me, I'm telling all this based on my experience. <laughs> I'm, I'm sure all of us have that experience. 
And for some people that you love, you know, not only you feel happy when they come, even if they are not coming, you call repeatedly. Can we meet? Can you come for dinner? Can you come for lunch? That person is not necessarily going to give you a, you know, big, you know, <laughs> brick of gold or something, but it's your mind. It's really your mind. And I have very often said, look at that example of a mother who is a very ugly child. An unevenly headed, you know, lopsided head or whatever, you know. Yeah, there are. It's true. Many ugly children, but the the mother doesn't see their child ugly. She showers press upon press to their child. That my child started walking. My child started speaking. All the good things you see, you don't see the bad side. It's really amazing. It's like a panacea, you know, which transforms everything into. Gold. And then especially if you are, as is already studied in the text, if you are able to see the vulnerability, the fragility of everybody, you know, you will develop some feeling. In Tibetan, the one word that is repeatedly used by Tibetans, how much they practice, I don't know. Nyingje, Nyingje, you know, Tibetans keep on saying Nyingje, Nyingje, but how much they practice, I don't know. But at least Nyingje, you know, really. And then look at the ordinary people, they, they, they are good people. They are doing their small thing, you know, for their study, for their food, for their family. That's all they want. Nothing big. So how come you are not letting these people live in peace and harmony? It's unthinkable. Really unthinkable. So it is important to make a promise in one's life that as much as possible, I will fall repeatedly, of course, I will not get enlightened in one day, I will, you know, fail. But I will continue to attempt to help others, to be nice with others, to live in harmony. That is my only goal in my life. What, what else you will get? Even you work very, very hard, if you become a good, great professor, very knowledgeable, write 20 books, and you have billions of dollars in your bank, wonderful, good. But still, that is not the main purpose of your life. And I'm not just telling this, I've read books after books of people who have reached to the zenith of their success. Just a few months back, a big CEO from America died, and the last thing that he said was, I worked so hard for success in name, I got money and everything. But now look at me, I'm leaving everything behind. And what, what I really now think that made my life meaningful was the occasions when I was nice to other people. Uh -huh. That's the reality. I'm not saying you don't need money, I'm don't, not saying that you need fame. But if you sacrifice your life for name and fame and this stupid glamorous life, deceptive pleasures, we already read, deceptive pleasures, rainbow pleasures, that will not necessarily make you happy and peaceful. It's 100 percent sure, 100 percent sure. So therefore, one very moving Buddhist prayer, prayer, prayer is Gadanada. She will love to be she will solid over, over, over here, meaning that may uh, sentient beings get liberated from this ocean of suffering, which is turbulent due to aging, sickness death and so forth. And plus this hundred thousand unnecessary man-made problems. Stupid as we are. Man-made problems. Problems made by so-called intelligent human beings. <laughs> right? We call ourselves intelligent human beings. In what sense are you intelligent? And we keep on doing those things which is like 
really not much meaning. And the core issue of making this world unified, harmonious, peaceful, not much is done. There are people, good people, who are trying to do something, but we need to do more than that. And the short-sighted leaders are intoxicated with their power and always brandishing their nuclear <laughs> arms, right? So therefore, I mean, it's really important to repeatedly do this prayer that we are able to develop this loving kindness, which means always think, may, may everybody be happy. May everybody meet with the cause of their happiness. Whoever they are, you include your enemy. And that will make you even more happy if you include your enemy. Because when you have some section of the society which you call as enemy, just that mental reflection will make you unhappy. So when we talk about developing loving kindness, it should be the kindness like a mother to her child. I mean, we cannot achieve that immediately, but that should be the target. Loving kindness means, loving kindness that the mother has to the child, we should try to develop similar kindness towards all sentient beings. Towards all sentient beings. For example, if I am a poor father, and my young child goes out and comes back home having found a big lump of gold. My, 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 my son found a big lump of gold. Will I be happy or sad? Because I'm poor. Huh? But my son somehow found a big lump of gold. And he shares this news to me. Will I be happy or not? Huh? You of course, very happy. I have not found the gold. My, my son found the gold, but still, because I have this loving kindness to my son, so therefore I will be very happy. So similarly, consider all other sentient beings as your loving children. Whenever they find happiness and peace through their own initiative, you, you did not even participate in getting that, making that happiness achieve, you know. You should be very happy if you have their loving kindness. Whenever you see some people flourishing, you feel very happy. And because of this loving kindness, you, you know, your association with others and in beings be like your association with your very dear friend. If you have somebody who you call as my hand and glove friend, huh? a very close friend, then we say we are like one person. We'll suffer together, we'll enjoy happiness together. The rest of sentient beings, whether you like it or not, we'll have to suffer together, live together in this small earth. If you really think properly, we'll sing or swim together. That's the reality of the world today. So with this understanding that we should be ready to share whatever we have to others. This is the reality, right? And then our concern towards others' well-being should be such, like that one story, there is one story of a Tibetan teacher. And when somebody comes to, you know, listen to him, then he would explain the teaching. Then after some time that, that person, he says, now I have to go. And then the teacher would still say, do you have a small children, you have small children in your home who are crying? so that you have to rush and go back without listening, continuing to listen to this teaching. Meaning that that person, that teacher has so much love for, that, for his students. And he regards this teaching so precious that if you are not in great rush, continue to listen. I want to help you, benefit you, you see. When you have that loving kindness, not necessarily the whole loving kindness, but even if you have a little bit of love, it's much easier to talk to other people. You spend hours together with that person, no problem. I'm talking about love, genuine love, not the attachment. 
if it is attachment and you know then yes initially may be good after some time there will be trouble <laughs> right so genuine loving kindness right and in order to successfully cultivate that loving kindness you need to destroy the opposite counter forces the one that will burn or destroy loving kindness just like a fire burns things is hatred or anger especially hatred ill will so in order to successfully cultivate loving kindness you need to re at the same time reduce enmity ill will hatred likewise you need to reduce attachment the buddhist teacher said that you should not develop attachment like a like a being in the hungry ghost being born as hungry ghost because the, the being born in the hungry ghost is deprived of food and drinks so is always hungry i need to have this i need to have this so we should not be like hungry ghost today's world is really like hungry ghost because there's so much coming in the market and everybody thinks whatever is in the market i need to have one look at how much we keep on updating our gadgets you see it's a clear indication you see i iphone 1 now up to 10 mm -hmm. then they will be probably 11 12 we think i need all of this not necessarily because you think you you need but because of your crave <coughs> your craving okay and similarly the text says it you should not be like a you know greedy dog the greedy dog even the dog has eaten enough but when he see other dog eating something he will say <laughs> you know he want he, he he will he will disturb that other dog <laughs> right but i'm saying i'm not saying it is easy is really not easy but if you give little bit thought to this you will see or you will appreciate the need and the importance of such loving kindness and then you will start at least slowly merging towards it okay yeah i guess so and do you think that um if we eliminate the um the negative our negative um behaviors and attitudes um will love um come naturally or do we have to actually do something as well so first of all maybe we eliminate our negative behaviors and attitudes yeah. will love naturally just come or do we have to um also cultivate something you know after we eliminate it these are actually these are really connected to each other the more you reduce the negative emotions the more there will be chances of you know easier production of many of these positive qualities but specifically in the case of loving kindness the two most obstructive factors are self grasping or self cherishing attitude so you need to lessen your self cherishing attitude okay and then your attitude towards every body should be non differentiating we call it equanimity so when you if you differentiate people okay this is from america this is black this is white this is tibetan this is chinese then your mind is already uneven you can't develop this genuine loving kindness so it should be equal towards everybody and then less self cherishing attitude because you include yourself with others seeing oneself and others as equal you are you are not the center of the universe normally we tend to think like that you know because it's related to me this is important this is something i do therefore it is important you see whoever you are intelligent not intelligent rich not rich but you think somehow you are the area from where you calculate things you know so that is really the problem and even even when you go to listen to a teaching if the teaching is teaching given by the teacher suits your temperament then you say oh very good teaching not necessarily good but because it suited your way of thinking and temperament 
if did not suit your temperament, your disposition, they say, oh, I don't know what this teaching is. There's not much meaning in it. You see, so you are the yardstick, which is, which is really wrong. Which is really wrong. So that's why there are stories of some of the Tibetan Buddhist teachers. In fact, there was one when he was requested to give a teaching. Then he said, I have nothing to teach. Excepting highlighting your faults. So, so if you <laughs> dare to do that, then sit. I'll highlight your faults, you see. That, that is the real teaching. But if we do that here, people will get angry, you see. Here or, I mean, in general, people, you know. Because the purpose of Dharma teaching is to find your weakness, shortcomings, and reduce them, eliminating them, and replacing them with the positive emotions. Okay, just two-minute meditation on the point that I've explained and see how far you feel comfortable doing this loving kindness meditation to your near ones, neutral sentient beings and enemies. Especially think about somebody who has been bothering you a long time and how, how do you feel? Is it possible to talk to that person? Have negotiation with that person? Thank you. That ends the session and your time to do the post meditative practice. <laughs> Seriously speaking, you know, try to cultivate as much as possible this loving kindness until we meet tomorrow and see whether it makes any difference in your perspective, in your dealing with other people. So this is how we need to exper you know, experiment all the time, whether it's really helpful or not. Thank you.